Now, the Guardian's going to be thrown off a little bit watching this video because I originally filmed this in her living room. However, when I got back to my place in Santa Monica, I added a corrupt data file. So I am redoing this. So basically, uh, Hiccup is a dog that's been in the house for about three weeks. Um, he's really overall a good dog, but he does have some dog reactivity and aggression issues. Now in the video above, we talked about different tips and tricks that you can do to make sure your dog is successful on a walk. Um, either practicing the U-turn. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the details in there, but a lot of uh, us, when our dog is giving us signals or signs that it's uncomfortable with things, we don't recognize those signs and we continue to move forward. And a lot of times that teaches the dog, hey, the human is not paying attention to me or looking out for me, so I have to look out for myself. And so in a lot of cases, the dog will lunge and bark and nip at other dogs or people, whatever it's fearful of. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to get more distance between them. Dogs have a fight or flight response. So if uh, I'm on a leash, that prevents me from flighting and often that accelerates the fighting. Now the Guardian uh, mentioned one of the incidents took place at Starbucks and the dog kind of was starting to uh, snap at other dogs. Now at that point she picked it up and sometimes you have to pick your dog up or do what you have to do to get out of the situation. In the future, I'd prefer that she leave the dog in the car um, as long as it's you know, uh, going to be safe to do so. We don't want a dog suffocating in a car or overheating. Um, I, but I don't think it's going to be the case because it's just running into Starbucks really quick. But if the dog goes into Starbucks and there are other dogs there and it's, and it's reacting, it's embarrassing for the guardian. Uh, but the more important thing is it's helping the dog practice that unwanted behavior. So during this session, we went over a number of tips and tricks and things that we can do to help change the, what I call the leader follower dynamic. One of those things is to do something what I call petting with a purpose, which means when the dog jumps up on the human, uh, which uh, Hiccup did a lot of, the human was reaching out and petting the dog. Anything our dog is doing when we pet it is what we're reinforcing and amplifying, including unbalanced states of mind like excitement, fear, anxiety, stress. So a lot of uh, us, when we have a dog that's fearful, we reach down and we pick it up or we pet it and we say, it's okay, it's going to be a good boy. Or we're trying to help them, but we're actually making things worse. So you can touch a dog and let it know I'm here with you without amplifying it. But if you're petting your dog with it's jumping up on you, you're, pet you're training your dog, jumping up on me is the best way to get attention. Now the guardian really struggled, uh, but she did a great job, but it was difficult for her because the dog's so cute, he would jump up and on her and he's waiting for her to pet and so she would just have to stop. I talked about uh, what I call the light switch going on and off. So when the dog uh, is doing something we want, we turn the light switch on and pet and shine a light on the dog by providing them attention, affection, or whatever it is. Um, we also turn the light off when the dog stops doing the thing or starts doing something we don't want. So if I'm petting the dog and then it jumps up on me, I stop petting it. And then I wait for the dog to figure out on its own to get down, as long as it's not doing anything too um, difficult or too problematic. And as soon as the dog gets down, I reach over and pet it and starts pet, and I say the word off. Or if it uh, gets off and goes in a sit, I pet it and say sit. Passive training or petting with a purpose is really about the dog telling the human what to do, which is the dog in the leadership role. So what we want to do instead of flip is flip the leader follow dynamic. So when the dog tells the human what to do, nothing happens. But then the dog, well, I guess something happens. The human gives the dog a counter order, tells it to sit. If it's already sitting, ask it to lie down, ask it to come and sit over here, whatever the case is. As soon as the dog sits, we pet it under its chin and we say the word sit and just the word sit. And also don't use crazy inflection. If you want to say sit, that's fine as long as you always say it that way. Um, and if other people in the house won't say it that way, don't say it that way yourself. We want dogs here inflection, so they won't need to hear the command word consistently the same way. Um, let me see, we also went over passive training. Passive training is recognizing the dog whenever it does something when it wa we want it to do organically. So every time the dog comes to us, pet it and say come. Every time it sits next to us, pet it and say sit. Every time it lays down, pet it and say crash or chill or whatever the word is we want to use. I think chill is what uh, one of the kids wants to call it. Now, um, uh, Hiccup didn't even know how to sit on command. The Guardian had pushed uh, Hiccup's butt down a couple times. And we really don't want to force a dog to do anything. I am very force-free as a dog behaviorist. I want to put the dog in stage scenarios or situations and either lure it or uh, help it figure out what I want it to do and then reward it richly when it does. So I spent some of this session uh, teaching uh, the Guardian how to get the dog to sit by using a food lure. And we also went over and spent some time upstairs going over how to teach the dog to come on command. Now usually I like a dog to come and sit in front of us on command. Uh, but since he is just learning sit, we just really rewarded just the come. Now for the come exercise, I'd like the guardian to practice that at least twice a day with uh, the two boys. The more people we practice it with, the better, but at least three people. Now we're going to start off in a triangle where we're all about eight feet apart and, you know, equal distance. And then one person's in charge, they get to point at that person and say come. 
Remember, I use my hand, like, I'm gonna show you to the side, but I would be facing the dog, and have my hand with my fingers slightly cupped with a treat there. So I say the word come. Actually, for hiccup, we were saying hiccup come, because he really doesn't know the come command. Now, the more that he comes to us and we pet him, when he does that organically for passive training, the better that'll, uh, the more productive that will be. So I say come once. If he looks at me and then doesn't come, well, the person who he's staying with should cross their arms and look up to the side. That's a way of saying, I don't have anything for you. Then the person who called him should make a kissing sound like this, and then start lowering their hand to the floor. The lower you go, the more it's for the dog. Now, once uh, Hiccup knows how to sit, if this is the dog's nose, when he comes to me, I wanna raise my hand over his head in an arc motion, not just vertically and not horizontally, and sell it like you, because you'll have a treat in there. So we go up over his head, he'll track up for a bit, and to get more elevation, he'll put his butt down. When he puts his butt down, lower it right away, let him tilt his head down and lick the treat off your hand and then tickle under his chin. This way we're always giving the dog a reward, uh, an affection reward, even if we don't have treats. And this motion will attract the dog's attention. Uh, now I only raise it up over the dog's head to put him in a sit if he doesn't do that on his own and he knows how to sit. So after a while he should start coming and sitting in front of you on his own. Now once we do this, when we do this way I usually have everybody have about five to seven treats depending on how many people. If we have a lot of people we might have less treats. And we start off about seven feet apart. Uh, the next step is to have one person move about 12 or 15 feet apart. We had, in this case, the mom move to the edge of the room. And so we're gradually making the exercise a little bit more difficult. Eventually, we want to have somebody beyond the line of sight outside of the room and maybe in the next bedroom. And then we have somebody upstairs and downstairs. And we want to keep calling and practicing the dog this way until the dog comes to find us anywhere in the house. And it was great to watch uh, Hiccup do it because Hiccup started having a bounce and step and running with glee. Uh, when you could see he was really enthused figuring it out. He's a smart little dog. Um, now for the uh, sit, I'd like the guardian to practice that. Um, really, we want to practice that probably throughout the day a couple times. Get maybe three or four treats. He's a little guy, so we're breaking him in half. Remember, push it, uh, touch his nose with it, and we always wanted to keep the treat within an inch of the nose. When the boys were trying to put the dog into a sit, they were pull, they were going like way high or way over. And then they'll get better at it as they practice, but if you start tracking like this and the dog stops tracking it, come back to the nose, and literally touch the nose if you have to. The idea is that the dog, we're kind of going up, and then he started dancing, and that was a lot of it because the boys were having the treat too far up. If you have a treat up here, the dog's gonna jump up or stand up to try to reach it. So we wanna keep it here against its nose or close to its nose and go up and keep tracking back until eventually the dog, you rock the dog back into a sit. As soon as it sits, pop that treat in, mouth, in its mouth and say the word sit. Remember, every time we give a treat, we wanna say the command word immediately after the treat goes into their mouth. Um, let me see, what else do we go over? Um, the guardian needs to fe uh, eat something before she feeds the dog. The eats, dogs eat in their order if they're rank. And what I do is I put the food in the bowl. I don't let the dog eat it because I use the escalating consequences, which I don't think I went over with the guardians. Uh, but basically, uh, just uh, don't put the food in, uh, in the bowl. Uh, the human should eat something first, just five or more bites of a cracker or a chip or uh, a piece of celery, something like that. Then we put the dog's food in and we put the bowl down. Now I use passive training to give the dog a command word. So every time Hiccup takes the first bite of food, maybe we say feast. And then uh, after a couple months, we say feast, and the dog runs over anticipating getting the food. Now we also went over some kennel training. Um, I don't, he, I, he's a Velcro dog, so he might have some separation anxiety, um, which is, and if a dog has that, we put him in a kennel to keep them safe. Um, but if a dog, uh, for a lot of dogs, the kennel actually causes them to panic. So we practice a little bit of how to release the dog out of the kennel. One of the things we did was we put the dog in the kennel, went downstairs, waited a minute or two, came back up, and he was all worked up. Well, I opened the door and I inserted my, my legs right up against the kennel, so the door of the kennel entrance, so he wasn't able to move out. I waited for him to stop pushing forward, and as soon as he did, I took a small, like, two-inch step backwards with both feet. And I waited there. Now, as soon as he started to come forward, I rushed back towards the kennel to block him from exiting. This is my way of saying no. Uh, we did this dance back and forth, back and forth, and eventually he started staying, so I took two steps and three steps. Now, when the family does this, we probably don't want to move any further back than the door uh, from the kennel as it opens. But eventually, you move further and further away. And we wait for the dog to sit. As soon as he sat, I dropped it in a knee and called him and said, come. Now, immediately after that, I gave him a treat and said, come. And then I tossed a treat back in the kennel, and we were using the command word of Pandora. So we let the dog go in the kennel. Eat, licks up the treat and then exits the kennel. We toss another treat. The kids want to probably do that three or four times a day throughout the day, each, each one of the kids. So that way the dog has practice. Also, we want to leave a treat in the kennel uh, with the door open when we're not there. And we want him to, every time I go in the kennel, man, good stuff happens to me. I really like this kennel thing. And we're going to say the word Pandora every time he goes in there so he has a positive 
uh, association. I like using farm command words. So uh, the, one of the kids, like I said, went, uh, to make it lay down, we were going to say the word chill. So every time that, uh, that Hiccup ch uh, lays down, we need to pet him and say chill. Now, if Hiccup is really excited and we pet him and say relax, we're putting that out of context because the dog's energy is not relaxed. It's excited. Remember, if we pet a dog and it's excited, we're going to make it more excited. So when we come home and the dog's loose, we should just completely ignore the dog. As soon as the dog calms down, we reach over to pet it. Now, if the dog, uh, if Hiccup is uh, jumping up on people when they come through the door a lot excitedly, uh, met, make sure you message me. I have a video and a technique that I can show you that will stop him from jumping, and it's super duper easy. Uh, let's see what else we went over. Uh, like I said, we have the video above about all the uh, walking exercises, but I also like the guardians to get, uh, ken uh, di not kennels, but to get dog beds. Now, I like to getting the ones off Groupon, and I like to get the ones that are Sealy, Posturepedic, or Memory Foam. They're not actually Memory Foam, they're just foam, and it's egg crate at the top. So, the, and I like to get the ones, those instead of the ones that are kind of filled with down, uh, like a comforter, because you have lumps in it. Remember, the way I talk, uh, teach the dog to go to Cabo, which is the name of the dog bed, is we toss a treat on there, we let the dog walk over, when he licks it up, after it goes in his mouth, we say the word Cabo, let him leave, toss another treat. The second way I do it is I leave a treat there, and this is why I like to get a light-colored dog bed, light cream, white, or light gray. So that way, when we leave the treat there, because dogs are colorblind, a light color is going to make that treat stand out. Also, make sure there's no pattern on it. Dogs' eyes are not very good for detail. Uh, if it's too busy, the dog might not see it. Um, and then when the dog walks over and looks up, we say the word uh, Cabo. After a while, he'll start going to the dog bed on his own. When he does, make sure we go over there and reward him or just say the word Cabo or toss a treat and say Cabo. Remember, we're going to reward desired actions and behaviors, whatever possible, to help entice the dog to continue emulating them. Now, uh, we probably should have a dog bed in every room in the house um, and give each one a different dog name. Now, some of the rules we went over, um, one of the rules the guardian already has is not allowing the dog in the furniture. Uh, but another rule would be the dog has to sit at the door before we let it in or out. So I go to the door and I say sit one time. He does, and I count to three in my head. If the dog doesn't sit, within three seconds I walk away. The more you say a command, the less you mean it. So don't repeat commands. After I ask Siri for a 60 second timer, and then after 60 seconds I go back to the door and I again tell the dog to sit, don't ask. And if he doesn't sit this time, I walk away for two minutes. Next time for four minutes then eight minutes, and keep on doubling the length of time until eventually when you go over and tell the dog to sit, he sits. As soon as he does that, open that door immediately. We want him to think he's got a remote control and his buddy opens, sits down, that door opens. Uh, and I remember when we go through the door, if we're going through the door with the dog, we need to go through the door first. Um, let me see, what else? Um, the Guardian, um, i trying to think. Uh, I did two sessions today and they're blurring together a little bit. So um, uh, other rules that we can enforce. Um, not being allowed in the kitchen. And if the dog goes in the kitchen, what we're going to do is we're going to walk directly at the dog. To a dog, standing up is a commanding position, and your authority goes whatever direction you're facing. So the dog goes in the kitchen, you're going to walk directly at him. This is why we did the exercise in the kennel. So you're going to walk directly towards the dog until where you get to wherever the boundary line is, and that's where we're going to stop enforcing. Now the dog's probably trying to go inside, so when he does take a step to the side and block him there. He goes this way, step, step to the side, block him there. And then as soon as the dog's stationary, you take a step backwards, left foot, right foot, and stop. Now this will probably cause the dog to try to come across the line, you rush at the dog again. And you keep on repeating this back and forth dance, kind of like we did in the kennel, until the dog stays behind the line. Now if the kitchen's behind me and I turn to, fade, to walk in the kitchen, I give the dog my back, the dog's going to run right up. So remember the first several times you're doing this, you're going to walk backwards facing the dog, uh, so that you're walking away from the dog while you're facing him. Um, and if the dog's not listening to you, you can stand up abruptly, turn to face your dog. That's a very commanding position in the dog world. Um, other rules would be the dog should not be within seven feet of any human who is eating. That's a way of challenging for food. We also don't want to give our dog any people food. I had my second session today, the guardians were actually giving uh, the dog um, avocado, which is toxic to dogs. And the dog had been get, having diarrhea, might be a correlation. Other toxins for dogs include grapes, raisin, nuts, um, uh, uh, onions, garlic, um, and basically most, uh, what do you call it, uh, most uh, nuts. So you don't want to give your dog those things, and certainly don't give it any people food, because that really confuses the dog what the leader-follower dynamic is. Uh, let me see. Uh, we also went over ways for the children to get reinforced by doing good behaviors with the dog, and we do that through chocolate. So what I do is I get a, a, a jug or a jar with each dog, or for each child, and we write the child's name on it, and the child can decorate it however they want. We explain to the children, I explain to them, that every time we pet our dog, that's how we pay the dog. And, or actually, uh, with the kids, I say uh, petting our dog is our way of saying thank you. 
So we're not going to pet the dog for no reason because that only leader dogs get petted for no reason. So even if I just want to pet the dog, I'm going to say I'm going to pet it. I ask it to sit. Even if it's not doing anything, it's not nudging me, I'm still going to say sit and then pet it for sitting. Um, now, the more we do this, the more the dog will start to offer that behavior. But it also respects the human. Now, dogs often do things with the, uh, kids often do things with the dogs we don't like. And so to give the kids the incentive, we're going to have those jars with each kid's name. And every time the kid pets the dog to say thank you for sitting, coming, laying down, going, at, sitting at the door, whatever it is, they tell mom or dad, mom or dad takes an M&M, piece of chocolate, and puts it in the jar. Now, we have a rule if the dog is on the dog bed or in the kennel and the child tries to bring the dog out, well, you lose an M&M for that. So what I would do is I'd take it out and say, do you, you know, oh, you're not supposed to do that. I have to take this away. Do you want to do something to earn this back? And then the child can actually do, has to sit, put the back in the kennel uh, or in the uh, a jar so they don't actually have to take treats away. But also we can use this as a motivator like... Um, if one of the children wants to go on a ski trip or something like that with their friends, hey, in order to do that, you're going to need 300 M&Ms by the such and such a date. And some of the guardians will like, uh, like to do a kind of competition. Um, whoever gets the most doesn't have to do dishes or gets a special chocolate, uh, piece of chocolate cake as well as the M&Ms. Or, you know, whoever is at the most at the end of, at the end of a month maybe gets uh, to have two friends come over, to, uh, to go to a movie, have a pizza party, and then spend the night. So you create an incentive for the children to do it. Dogs are through repetition, consistency, and good timing. Well, if, you're, if the kids are now all practicing 20, 30, 50, 75 sits or whatever it is each day, that's going to really accelerate the dog's learning curve. It's also going to help the dog respect the humans more. Um, okay, and also we'd like to have the kids training the dog. Dogs have a boost of self-esteem and confidence when they master new skills or exercises just like humans do. So in the future, what we'd like to do is I'd like to have uh, the kids uh, practicing. So maybe one of the kids goes to YouTube and they look up uh, a trick and they get it approved by mom and dad and then they teach that dog that trick. Then the rest of the week, we practice, all the, everybody else practices that same trick with the dog. The next week, the, next, uh, the other child teaches the dog a trick and then everybody else practices that. I'd like the kids to, do, to pick at least four, but it'd be ideal if each kid could do eight. Then at the end of my time, summer rolls around, the dog has learned 16 new commands. That's really going to boost his self-esteem and help him respect uh, the children even more. Um, let me see. Um, t -t 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 what else do we want to go over? Um, God, I went over so much. Um, uh, let me see. Other rules. Um, oh, ways to delay gratification. Uh, the dog really likes to play fetch, but he likes to go to different places. He doesn't bring the, uh, the ball back. So what I do when I play fetch is I have a treat first. I take the ball, and as I throw the ball, I say the word fetch. When the dog goes over and gets it, when he picks it up with his mouth, I say the word fetch. And then I hold the treat out and make sure the dog sees it. We, and then this will attract the dog to come to us. Now, a lot of times he'll try to take it with the ball still in his mouth. Don't tell him to drop, just wait. As soon as he drops it, don't go for the ball, pop the treat in his mouth and say the word fetch a third time. Then pick up the ball, tell him to sit, and throw the ball again. The Guardian may want to consider getting an iFetch. It's a product that was uh, showcased on uh, Shark Tank. It's basically a machine that lets the dog play fetch by itself. And if the Guardian wants to do that um, and needs to help on training how to do that, please message me and we, I'm happy to set up a uh, follow-up session. Well, I do one-hour follow-up sessions for that sort of thing. And uh, we can teach him that as well as address any lingering issues. Now, for some dogs with their uh, aggression issues, it is something where we do need to set up a follow-up session. That's one of those uh, dogs that fall into the one percentile. So what I would recommend is in about a month from now, actually probably about two or three weeks, if the guardian is not seeing a noticeable improvement on the dog's reactivity towards other dogs, to let me know and we can set up a follow-up session where we can maybe have one of her friends come over with the dog and we can do what we call bat training or behavior adjustment training and teach the dog some social skills and build its confidence so that it feels comfortable hanging out with dogs that it doesn't know. Um, just like us, uh, we get a little bit weird when we come to shut in and we don't get that social stimulation. So it's going to be really important that we find some dogs that he can like and enjoy and be around because that's a great way to burn some excess energy. So if you're, like I said, if he's continuing to be aggressive uh, towards or reactive towards other dogs, um, first of all, if it happens in the case, make sure you move away. That's why I went through the U-turn in the video above. Always increase the distance between you and the dog or whatever your dog is reacting to. Sometimes you have to walk around something to block its line of sight. Uh, but we could, I could teach you a focus exercise, some other things that help redirect the dog's attention. I'm hoping, since he's a new dog, once we flip the leader follower dynamic, that he's going to start being more open to listening to the guardians and uh, not think it's his job to protect them. But he might have been a street dog or something along those lines. He did show me some signs of things that maybe he, uh, his leg looked a little bit weird, his gait was a little bit weird at times. So the guardian may want to have uh, their, her regular vet 
when she finds regular fat, um, uh, take some x-rays of his uh, paws to, let, uh, uh, to help him get over that. Now also, uh, for groomers, I mentioned uh, taking the dog to the groomer and just having her feed him some treats and then leaving. And doing that a couple times before you take him in to actually have him groomed. Now, grooming is a very invasive uh, thing for a lot of dogs, and they took him in and did a little bit, but he was too worked up, they couldn't really do the whole thing. They needed to do his paws. They also need to get his nails trimmed. Now, I would recommend doing a Dremel and teaching the dog how to use a Dremel, or not the dog, but the humans, and this way you can put a nice round edge, and that way the hard, it's not hard when the dog jumps up, or it's not gonna scrape us. So uh, that might be something we might set up a follow-up session where we can teach the dog to enjoy having its nails dremeled, and also teach it how to use the eye fetch at the same time. Okay, well normally this would be when I would have Hiccup on my lap and I would say this is Hiccup's roadmap to success, but Hiccup is in the Palisades. I'm in Santa Monica right now, so you're going to have to just settle for me. Uh, this is Hiccup's uh, roadmap to success. Remember, everything that you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.